Both the mainstream and alternative media speak of the rise of populism, generally speaking on the back of Brexit, Trump and the increasing publicity given to the European elections, notably the Dutch elections and the upcoming French ones. This gives the impression that something has drastically changed, that paradigms have shifted and that a new vanguard of right-wing politics is on the rise in response to mass migration, the EU, globalisation and political disaffection. This video is not going to try to discern the why, but rather the if. Uh, is populism rising at all? It's hard to find information on this that isn't plagued by partisanship. So see this as an earnest analysis of the situation. This video studies electoral data from 13 different European states to discern the influence the right-wing populist parties have had, both in the present and the past. I have only used data from national elections to level the playing field. For example, it would be unfair to compare Austrian votes for the FPO in Corinthia, a historical stronghold of the party, and votes for the Lega Nord in Puglia, and thus regional elections have been left out of the equation. I have also omitted countries in which there is no populist right to speak of, at least not to a significant degree, in this case Spain and Portugal. Greece has also been omitted. It does have the Golden Dawn, however this party are not comparable to say UKIP or the Front National or the PVV. Thus they're not included. If you are interested in learning more about them, please see my video Who are the Golden Dawn? should also point out that in Spain, Portugal, Greece and to some extent Italy, left-wing populism has been the true victor. Note that when people speak of the rise of populism they are generally referring to Western Europe and so data from Eastern Europe has not been included. Of course, notable examples in Eastern Europe would be Fidesz in Hungary and the Law and Justice Party of Poland, both of which are now in government. Anyway, let's get started. As we've just had elections in the Netherlands, it seems fitting to start here. You'll notice that since the early 21st century, the populist right has been a significant electoral force in the form of Pim Fortuyn List and of course Hurt Wilders' Party for Freedom. Prior to that, the Dutch had the Centre Party, then followed by the Centre Democrats. The Centre Party aren't really comparable to Wilders in many respects. They initially started as an offshoot of the NVU, who never received more than 0.4% of the vote. The NVU were largely made of former NSB members, a Dutch National Socialist outfit, and were eventually banned in 1978. Thus the Centre Party was born as an offshoot launched by Henry Brookman. Brookman gave the reins to Hans Janmat in 1982 and won 0.8% of the vote and thus a seat in the House of Representatives. Then we can see another increase in the 1984 Euro elections in which they won 2.5% of the vote. Not entirely insignificant. In the end, Jan Matt was expelled from the Centre Party by the more extremist NVU faction. The Centre Party suffered terribly in the 1986 elections and subsequently imploded. Jan Matt joined the Centre Democrats, shown in green, and the more extreme nationalist factions founded the Centre Party 86. The Centre Democrats did compete in the 1986 elections, but received barely 0.1% of the vote. This then drastically improved and in the 1994 elections they won three seats. The Centre Democrats ultimately imploded due to a highly repressive political environment, both due to a cordon sanitaire implemented by all other parties, but also political violence from opponents and the vicious social ostracism of party members. This meant it was difficult to attract activists and moderates necessary for broader appeal. For more information on them, check my video Kurt Wilder's Conviction in Context, although I think I'll likely do a video series on the centre parties at some point. Then of course we have the rise of Pim Fortuyn, who entered government posthumously. His assassination days before the election may have increased votes for the party on a short-term basis, but ultimately proved to be their downfall. Without the direction of their leader, they imploded. The government collapsed within months. It was the shortest government in Dutch history. Now we come to Wilders. The basic trend is a fairly consistent 10-15% to of reliable votes, with his best showing in the 2009 parliamentary elections. What is perhaps surprising to many watching this video is how unremarkable the last elections were. We saw nothing out of the ordinary with Wilders' results. Not a bad result, not a good one, just a basically predictable one. Also, should probably point out, we have Forum for Democracy that competed in the last elections. They got about 1.8% of the vote. I guess significant for an incredibly new party, but nothing groundbreaking here. So is populism rising in the Netherlands? I think the answer is not especially. 
Collapse in support for the traditional parties is more significant, which increases the visibility of other parties. A decrease in support for the establishment hasn't entailed an increase for Wilders, though. I haven't included data for the FPO prior to 1986. This is because the FPO back then were a very different party under the leadership of Norbert Steger, who was leading the party in an increasingly socialist direction, even to the point of forming a potential alliance with the centre-left SPO. Jörg Haider came to front the party in 1986 and the party became a populist right-leaning party against immigration. This then paid dividend come 1999 when the party successfully entered a government coalition with the centre-right OVP. This resulted in an international uproar and even some symbolic EU sanctions, although this amounted to little more than refused handshakes, which then became relaxed a year later. Ultimately, governmental involvement dissatisfied the party base as the more hardline policy elements had to be dropped. Some of the moderate higher-ups rebuked Haider in 2002, for example, when he hosted a meeting attended by other radical right European party leaders, illustrating this difference in vision for the party. This split between the moderates and the hardliners decimated support for the party, who were severely compromised in government from 2003 to 2005. The FPO then left government following Haider's split from the party to form the BZO. As Haider took most of the FPO government team with him, the BZO completed the term until 2007. The BZO were gaining ground and we see a good performance in 2008, but ultimately, following Haider's tragic death that same year, imploded. The FPO have since been regathering support since their time in government. Their presidential election run in 2016 was a very good showing, with a vote of 36% in the first round. It seems likely that in 2018 the party will be the largest in the National Congress, and thus Stracker could well be vice-chancellor. So, is populism rising in Austria? Well, kind of, but it's important to not go overboard in saying that. They haven't come from out of nowhere. The party has been a fixture of Austrian politics for some time, and as stated, has been in government. So, yes, they're definitely doing well, and will very likely see good gains next year, but this isn't a revolution. The FPO are an established party gaining ground. This graph is slightly misleading in that in Germany, state elections are taking place constantly, as states have their elections at different times of the year. However, this video, like I said, focuses solely on national results and thus state results have been excluded. So some parties that have done fairly well in some states, for example, the NPD does relatively well in Saxony. In 2004, they obtained almost 10% of the vote aren't shown here to be of particular significance, even though they've gained state influence. 1969, we can see, was a, relatively speaking, good year for the NPD, as they received 4.3% of the vote. However, this failed to win them any seat in the Bundestag, which has a 5% vote threshold. The party have since never matched this showing and have never had national representation. Also of importance is the 2014 EU elections. The NPD won a seat in the European Parliament. This is not the result of an electoral increase, they barely scraped 1% of the vote, but due to the electoral threshold in Germany being reduced from 3% to 1%. Expect a video on the NPD in the future. Now look at 1989. The European elections saw the sudden rise of the Republican Party, shown in orange. But then we can see their sudden dissolution in the 1990 federal elections. The Republicans were campaigning against immigration, but always struggled internally with a more moderate faction and a more hardline NPD-oriented faction. Their leader, Sean Huber, in 1990 claimed the party had become overrun with NPD members and stepped down. The party has since never had significance. At this point, it's important to note the constraints the aforementioned parties have faced in Germany. German constitutional constraints have essentially forbade these parties from operating, and numerous attempts have been made to shut down the NPD. For example, in 2001, the federal government attempted to ban the party, but ultimately these plans fell through. As it turns out, the party was so heavily infiltrated by the state, it was impossible to decipher which party decisions were genuine and which were state-orchestrated. And of course, there is the social ostracism and threats of violence from political opponents. This puts a high social cost on membership, which largely attracts extremist elements, pushing away moderates and thus guaranteeing electoral obscurity. Lastly, we have the AFD. Looking at their results in the context of this graph, they don't seem too dissimilar from the Republicans. They still don't have national representation in the Bundestag, falling just short in 2013. 
However, they are predicted to make gains and, for the first time ever for a radical right party, enter the Bundestag this year. See my video on them for more information. So is populism rising in Germany? Without sounding premature, we'll know for sure later this year. I think it's fair to say yes. Switzerland has the most successful radical right party in Europe, the Swiss People's Party. Not only that, but the Swiss People's Party is the most successful party in Swiss history. The party has been a constant in government since 1929, but only became a radical right party come the mid-90s under the direction of Christoph Blocher and his Zurich party branch. After the 2007 election, we see a slight dip in support as the party split and the Conservative Democratic Party was formed. This had little lasting effect on the party and they had their best electoral performance ever in 2015. For more information on them, see my video Who are the Swiss People's Party? The constant blue line you see is National Action, an anti-immigrant party that has had little influence outside the launching of referendums. We see a bump at the 1971 elections, which was due to an increased profile after launching a referendum to reduce foreign workers. It didn't pass, but did gain 46% approval amongst the Swiss, and so was significant. Now we have a look at the 1991 federal elections. Notice the green bump? Well, that's the Swiss Automobilist Party that later became the Freedom Party. They appeared in response to the rising environmentalist movement and sought to represent car owners. They also picked up on the immigration issue but fell into obscurity soon after. Also included for the sake of completeness, you'll notice the red line beginning in 1991 up to the present. That's the Ticino League modelled around Umberto Bossi's Lombardi League in Italy. The party are regionalist and represent the Italian speakers in the region of Ticino. Thus, it's not really fair to place their performance on a national graphic as they are not a national party. But they exist and do reasonably well in their respective canton. So, is populism rising in Switzerland? I think it's more accurate to say that it's already risen. Here we are centred on two parties, primarily the Flams Bloc and the Flams Berlang, which are actually different incarnations of the same outfit. Flams Bloc was founded in the late 70s with a hardline stance on Flemish secession. Its purpose was to sever the secessionist movement from the Volksunie, the party that hitherto had served as the main outlet for Flemish independence aspirations, as many felt they'd made too many concessions to the government. The party was always anti-immigration, but this theme came to be intensified and eventually the issue of Flemish independence, although still a core part of the party ideology, took a back seat. 1987, as we can see, saw the first gains for the party, who campaigned on the slogan of one's own people first. This newly found emphasis on immigration upset many of the party old guard, who criticised the party's increasing resemblance to the Front National in France. In 1991, the party officially overtook the VU in the Chamber of Representatives, a result that became known as Black Sunday amongst the political establishment. Speaking of the establishment, all parties strictly contained the Flames Bloc with a watertight cordon sanitaire. Indeed, the term actually originates from how the Belgian establishment treated the bloc. The anti-immigration rhetoric continued. The party actually favoured a mandatory repatriation policy at one point, and their support continued to rise throughout the 90s. The party attempted to moderate itself towards the beginning of the 21st century and to great success. At their height, they could claim to represent one in four Flemish voters with formidable strongholds in key provinces, notably Antwerp. This is somewhat eluded on the graph, as again we're focusing on national votes here, but the trends are clear. A regionalist party, only active in half of the country, obtaining just shy of 15% of the vote is monumental. Come 2004, the party was essentially outlawed for breaking anti-racism legislation. The party reformed within days under the new name, Flams Belang, but since then the NVA have eclipsed the party. The NVA is still regionalist, but without a platform of anti-immigration. Expect a more detailed account of the Flams Belang and its history in the near future. The intermittent yellow line you see, generally hovering well below 5%, is the National Front, the party no longer exists and fails to gain significance throughout its lifespan. The party was unionist, strongly anti-Flemish independence, anti-immigration and, as the name would suggest, strongly based on the French National Front, although Jean-Marie Le Pen paid them little mind. Maybe I'll explore them in more detail at a later date. So, is populism rising in Belgium? 
No, I think it's fair to say that populism is declining. From one national front to another, we see a significant leap at the 1984 elections. This is because the mainstream Gaullist right actually formed an alliance with the party in the regional elections of 1983 to block the left. The most notorious example was in Drew, whereby the Rally for the Republic and the Union for French Democracy aligned themselves with the Front National in the second round of the elections. This provided the party with political legitimacy, and the results can be seen clear as day in the 1984 European elections. The party continued to grow, and by 1995 had won mayorships in three French cities. You'll notice a dip in 1999, which resulted from inner party turmoil. The split resulted from factions in the Front National wanting to cooperate increasingly with the centre-right, something Le Pen rejected outright. Bruno Maigret thus left the party, taking a sizeable contingent of activists and politicians with him. Together they founded the National Republican Movement, to put their reach into perspective. In 1999 they obtained 3% of the vote in the Euro elections, which accounts somewhat for the dip we see in the National Front's performance. However, come 2004 they were to obtain as little as 0.3% of the vote. This ultimately did little to hinder the National Front. The 2002 presidential election saw a boom for Jean-Marie in his presidential bid in which he received his highest national vote share ever. This is where the National Front got into the second round of the presidential race, but were ultimately crushed by the incumbent Chirac. This demoralising defeat led to electoral decline for the party. Look at the 2007 National Assembly elections. The party barely achieved 4%, their lowest showing since 1981. Marine Le Pen came to front the party in 2011 and has taken the party from strength to strength. The party experienced their best electoral performance ever in the European elections of 2014, and then again in the regional elections the next year. This was largely due to her programme of de-demonisation. For more information, please see my video How Marine Le Pen Took France. The party has predicted a similar result in this year's elections, although we will likely see a similar scenario to 2002 in the second round. So is populism rising in France? Yes it is, but we've seen sizeable peaks and troughs before. This is simply the largest peak we've seen to date. The party have built a secure political subculture and they can readily depend on a loyal 10 to 15% of voter support in national elections. I haven't included data from Italy prior to the founding of the Second Republic on the back of the Tangentopoli scandals that rocked the country and unblocked the political system in 1992. Again, we have the problem of a regionalist party being represented nationally, which undermines their significance. Still, a regionalist party, the Lega Nord, shown in blue, only speaking for the northern areas of the country obtaining 10% is significant. Keep in mind here also that vote share isn't necessarily an indicator of political power. For example, look at the 2001 election results. It looks like a poor year for the Lega, but in fact they ascended to government with Forza Italia and the National Alliance and participated in government until scandals rocked the party in 2011, hence the very poor showing in 2013. For more on them, check my video Who are Lega Nord? I was reluctant to include the MSI or the National Alliance or the Brothers of Italy here because they're a post-fascist party and not of the same party family as the radical right. Still for posterity, I've dropped them in to give an example of their reach and they are represented in green. Their growth in power in the early 90s can be attributed to Berlusconi rehabilitating their image through his media empire in order to ready them for coalition in 1994. In 2006, the National Alliance merged into Berlusconi's party. A few dissatisfied with this move formed the Brothers of Italy, who we see again in 2013, although much less successful than their predecessor. Also not included in this graphic is Berlusconi, who himself can be considered a populist, so that's something to bear in mind also. However, he's very different to, say, Marine Le Pen or Hart Wilders, and so I didn't think it appropriate to include him here. I guess it's worth noting that throughout the majority of the first decade of the 21st century, populism was the Italian political establishment. And lastly, we come to Five Star Movement. Now, these guys are not radical right-wing populists. They're populists, sure, but they are probably more towards the left than the right if we wish to categorise them that way, although they would not be happy with that classification. I've included them here because of the false perception many have of them and to advise all interested to watch my video who are Five Star Movement. 
They were previously Eurosceptic and aligned with Nigel Farage's group in the EU Parliament. That said, they've since attempted to join the Europhile Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, but were rejected due to past Euroscepticism. So, is populism rising in Italy? Well, in the form of the Five Star Movement, sure. Salvini of the Lega Nord is also working to expand the scope of the party outside the North, but I'm doubtful this will pay off. As for populism reminiscent of Le Pen or Wilders or Frau Petri, the answer is no. No, right-wing populism is not rising in Italy. Now, I know I still haven't done a video on UKIP, it will happen, I promise, but for now, let's just have a very cursory look, and I mean very cursory look, at electoral figures. I should probably stress here that Britain's politics work on a first-past-the-post system and not proportional representation, as we have seen in the majority of cases thus far. Also, for every parliamentary seat a party contests, a £500 deposit is required. That is only returned provided the party obtains 5% of the vote or more. This makes it very difficult and costly for newcomers, as fielding enough candidates to successfully compete nationally is potentially very expensive business. I've included here both the BMP and UKIP. BMP in blue, UKIP in green. We noticed the pattern of votes for UKIP and the BNP being relatively similar, except for 2010 and 2015, where we see the complete decimation of the BNP. The party is, for all intents and purposes, defunct these days. I will definitely be having an in-depth look at them in the future. This similarity in voter pattern reflects the salience of EU scepticism amongst the electorate. The BNP, for most Britons, was either too extreme or considered too inexperienced to warrant a vote for national government, whereas a vote in the EU election seemed more palatable. UKIP had the same problem, although this stemmed more from the party being, for most of its history, a wholly single-issue party. The party is now trying to overcome this, and their performance in 2015 was very promising. I wonder how the party will fare without European elections to compete. The BNP look pretty insignificant, but really have a look at 2009 and we see a significant bump. Um, in the UK, this was considered incredibly significant. They obtained just short of a million votes in the EU elections, and this was the best result a far-right party had ever achieved in UK history. For the first time ever, their leader, then Nick Griffin, appeared on the weekly political panel show Question Time, although he was universally panned for giving a very poor performance. To be fair, he was entering a lion's den. In a way, the BNP were a victim of their own success, I guess, and the party, under increasing scrutiny, buckled under pressure and internal disputes. So, is populism rising in the UK? Well, yes. UKIP are on the rise, however, how they will perform electorally post-Brexit is up in the air. Especially so without Nigel Farage. As a party that have always positioned themselves as little more than a single issue group, it will be difficult for them to attract substantial support on a different platform. Expect a video on them in the future. Here we focus on the Norwegian Progress Party. Looking at recent trends, it would give the impression that the party is losing steam. I don't think this is rightly fair to say. The party started as Anders Langer's party for a strong reduction in taxes, duties and public intervention. Catchy, isn't it? But then in 1977 came under the control of Hagen, who reorientated the party on a message of smaller government and anti-immigration, modelled off their Danish counterparts who we will come to next. This led to an increased electoral slice of the pie, as we can see leading up to the 1989 parliamentary elections. This then subsided in 1993, largely under pressure from the more moderate wing of the party, who wanted less of a focus on immigration and more on liberal economics. This upset popular support, and at a 1994 party conference, Karl Hagen renewed his allegiance to the party's nationalist wing, and their growth resumed. By 2001, the party was becoming increasingly respectable and were necessary to pass the budget for the Christian Democrat-led government. Hagen by this point had initiated a moderation programme to make the party a viable coalition prospect. This culminated in 2006 with the ascension of Siv Jensen as party leader, who had less populist baggage than Hagen and proved more attractive to other parties. 2013 may seem like a bad year for the party, but really it wasn't. The party toned down their rhetoric in order to attract partners for government. The party is now in government as a coalition partner of the Conservatives. Despite losing thousands of party members, electorally the party seems relatively stable, hovering at about 15% in opinion polls. So, is populism rising in Norway? <laughs> Not really. Its populist party is toning down its message and is remaining in a position of moderate electoral strength. 
Morwen Hulstrup's Progress Party is a strange case in that in less than a year it became the second largest party in Denmark, getting over 15% of the vote. This wasn't initially on the basis of anti-immigration sentiment, but was certainly on a right-leaning small government low taxes populism. The party founder infamously declared that he paid 0% income tax, which, unsurprisingly, come 1983, he was imprisoned for. The party subsequently came under the leadership of Pia Kiesko, but intense party squabbles, dwindling support and unqualified representatives made the situation nigh unmanageable. As a result, Kiesko founded the Danish People's Party in 1995, represented by the Green Line. We can see after their departure the virtual freefall decline of the Progress Party. Between 2001 and 2011, the party was in a support role with the Conservative Liberal Coalition and then returned to the opposition in 2011. Now, since 2015, the party is again in a support role. In the last parliamentary elections, they obtained 21.1% of the vote, becoming for the first time ever the second largest party in the country. To provide you with some context of their reach in terms of policy, the Conservative-led government, thanks to the Danish People's Party, have recently passed legislation that makes non-Danish-dominated communities illegal in Denmark. So, is populism rising in Denmark? Well, yes, it is, as the Danish People's Party is doing incredibly well and increasing its support. But again, this hasn't come out of nowhere and has more or less been a staple of Danish politics since the 1970s. Here the focus starts on new democracy, but before I get into them, let's have a look at the Green Line. Notice how stagnant it was prior to 2010, never obtaining even so much as 5% of the vote. This is the Sweden Democrats, who now seem to be the second, if not the largest party in the country. So, see the blue line that starts just over 5%? Well, that's new democracy, formed by the odd and idiosyncratic duo of Bert Carlsen and Ian Wackmeister. They were very similar to the Danish and Norwegian progress parties in that the primary message was that of anti-establishment sentiment and reducing taxation. Winning over 5% of the vote in their first year is very significant as the Swedish political system has the relatively high entry point of 4% required for parliamentary representation. This is what proved a huge obstacle for the Sweden Democrats in later years. In any case, ultimately, New Democracy blundered due to poor party organisation and rifts between its leadership. If you want to know more, watch my video, Who are the Sweden Democrats? The Sweden Democrats were actually going before New Democracy arrived on the scene and first competed electorally in 1988, although received barely 1,000 votes. Being an offshoot of street activism organisation Keep Sweden Swedish, the party had strong connections with Sweden's burgeoning neo-Nazi skinhead scene, which came to severely hinder them at a later date. The party from the mid-90s onward started a process of moderation that culminated in Jimmy Ockerson's leadership come 2005. Ockerson, to a large extent, is managing to present the party as a legitimate political force, and for the first time in the party's history, they gained representation in Parliament in 2010, with 5.7% of the vote. Within four years, have a look at 2014, they doubled their vote to 12.9%. The 2018 elections could see a further doubling of support, as one YouGov poll from March 2017 placed the party at 23.9%. The problem for the party, as has been the case with others covered, is they are under a cordon sanitaire, which will likely preclude the established parties from working with them. As stated before, Increased vote share doesn't necessarily imply increased political clout. So, is populism rising in Sweden? Undoubtedly, yes. Yes, it is. But it seems likely that, in the same way that happened in the last Dutch elections, the institutional constraints of coalition forming will paralyse their ability to enter government. The Rural Party started as an offshoot of the Centre Party, fronted by a fiery populist, Veiko Venemo, although not really interested in Finnish nationalism. He drew most of his support on the back of corruption scandals in Finland that gave him an opportunity to rail against the establishment. Towards the mid-90s, we can see that the party's support declined substantially, and in 1995 they went bankrupt. They've been included here as the political style of Venemo's outfit planted the seeds for what was to come. Former secretary of the rural party, Timo Soini, founded the Party of Finns. Their main goal was to disrupt the traditional rule by consensus politics of Finland, which traditionally has consisted of numerous parties in coalition governments with vocal opposition strongly selected against, as office-seeking has been the primary objective. 
we see a very sudden leap in support between 2009 and 2011, which can be attributed to huge corruption scandals about the time in Finland, which implicated centre-party politicians who largely share the same voter base as the Finns party. Not only that, but during this period they radicalised their message. In 2009 they became a founding member of Nigel Farage's Europe for Freedom and Democracy group in the EU Parliament. Also of significance was the increasing visibility of a more radical anti-immigration branch informally led by Yussi Alaho, which in the short term boosted the party's electoral results. You'll notice that in the 2011 parliamentary elections the party obtained over 20% of the vote, but actually rejected the prospect of entering government, worried that doing so would reduce their subsequent electoral strength. Again, keep in mind that voter support does not necessarily translate into political power. The 2015 elections saw reduced support, but now the party is in government coalition. Since doing so, the party has lost monumental levels of support and now sits at under 10% in the polls. Soini has announced that he will be stepping down from his position, which potentially leaves the door open for Yussi Alaho to step up as party leader. If this happens, we can expect an increasingly radical direction for the party of Finns. If you want to know more about them, have a look at my video, Who are the party of Finns? So is populism rising in Finland? No. At present, it's experiencing a decline. So to summarise, according to me, right-wing populism seems to be rising in France, Germany, Sweden, Austria, Switzerland, Denmark and the UK. On the other hand, it's not rising in Spain, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Belgium and Finland. And lastly, it seems that right-wing populism is remaining at a pretty consistent level in both Netherlands and Norway. I guess, to be honest, the results aren't too exciting. We aren't seeing an explosion in support anywhere, really, apart from Sweden, perhaps, which has seen a very dramatic increase in support for the Sweden Democrats. If you're interested in the individual differences between the parties or their individual histories, please have a look at the other videos on my channel. Anyway, I hope this video has been illuminating. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If you like the video, please do click like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you didn't like it, click dislike and leave a comment and tell me why not. Massive thank you to all of my patrons. If my stuff is useful to you, then please do consider donating if it's within your means to do so. As always, thanks a lot and until next time.